Great. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jordan Mone. I'm the Director of Events and Communications for the Center for Security Studies and Security Studies Program. Welcome to our latest and second to last event in our spring speaker series, The Future of Security. A few quick uh, practical notes. You will note that you were muted automatically when you joined the Zoom session. Please do remain muted unless you are asking a question so that everybody can hear our speaker. You are welcome to turn your camera on. We also know that this is the lunch hour, so you may be eating and would prefer to keep your camera off. Um, that is totally fine as well. You will also see that we are recording today. That means that if you do ask a question out loud and you have your camera on, your screen will be recorded. Um, your audio will also be recorded. However, if you aren't speaking on microphone at all, then your video will not be recorded, even if you have your camera on the entire time. And if you would prefer not to have your voice recorded, um, you can just submit any questions via chat. On that note, we will have a good portion of Q&A time at the end of this event. Please do hold on to your questions until then, just in case our speaker covers them. Uh, before we get to ask them. Uh, you will be able to either use the raise hand function in Zoom to ask your question out loud, or you can send it in the chat either to everyone or directly to me, and I will ask it on your behalf. With all of that out of the way, I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Lal Saab, who is a senior fellow and director of the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute, or MEI. In addition, he is, of course, an adjunct professor here at Georgetown's Security Studies Program, where he teaches graduate courses on US defense policy in the Middle East and international security studies. Prior to joining MEI, he served as a senior advisor for security cooperation in the Pentagon's Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy with oversight responsibilities for US Central Command. His new book, which we are here to talk about today, is called Rebuilding Arab Defense, US Security Cooperation in the Middle East and it will be available very soon in the last week of April or the first week of May. With all of that said, Bilal, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you all for uh, joining us uh, this morning, I think. Uh, it's still morning. Um, and thank you to Georgetown, and especially the uh, Center uh, for Security Studies for hosting me. It really is an honor to be a part of the Georgetown uh, family. And uh, I also wanna say hi to my students. I think I saw a couple of names that I am familiar with. Um, that's SEST 646. I think um, uh, some of you uh, are watching this and uh, I very much look forward to seeing you tomorrow night uh, as usual. All right, so <clears throat> rebuilding Arab defense, US security cooperation in the Middle East. Maybe writing a book uh, during a global pandemic is the dumbest idea or maybe the smartest idea. I don't know which one it is, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, this book is finished certainly with a lot of help uh, from people I admire and who have taught me quite a bit throughout my career, uh, including Ken Pollack, who's also a member of the Georgetown family, uh, Jim Mattis, uh, Joe Votel, Mike Nagata, uh, Dan Byman, uh, Tony Zinni, and many others. Uh, for the next half an hour or so, I'd like to tell you the story of this book, uh, which you know any, any author would tell you is always hard because you know, in their mind, every word in the book counts and every piece of this puzzle is critical, which of course is not true. Uh, whether you're writing a book, a paper, a short article or a commentary, an opinion, if you can't tell your audience why your subject is relevant and in my world of public policy, why it's policy relevant, then I think you're doing it wrong. Uh, so I'd like to start with that. Uh, why rebuilding Arab defense in my opinion, is increasingly policy relevant. And I'm gonna give you two, uh, two reasons. The first, we all know that we have new global priorities that center on the pacing challenge of China. That, that means that we're going to be investing a lot more in the Indo-Pacific region. This is what the old and the new national defense strategy uh, calls for. And because our resources, financial and military, are finite. And because our political bandwidth is limited, we are obligated, whether we like it or not, to reduce our involvement in the Middle East and shift some of those resources that we use in the region to uh, the Far East, or if you want to call it the Indo-Pacific. Now, 
because of us drawing down in the Middle East, which certainly I don't want to exaggerate, but I do want to acknowledge because it's real. I mean, look at what we <clears throat> did in Afghanistan with our withdrawal, right? Our regional partners must step up to avoid the emergence of new security vacuums, which let's face it, typically tend to be filled by adversaries, not partners. The challenge is that those regional partners are less able to step up because most of them have weak military capabilities. So even if they are willing to make more meaningful contributions to regional security, they simply can't because of these weak military capabilities, at least not anytime soon. Now, from that problem set, you can go in different directions and you can write different books. You, know, you can explain why our Arab partners have militaries that are ineffective, which is exactly what Ken Pollock wrote in his book, Armies of Sand. Now I chose to focus on something different, though I believe it's complementary to the scholarship on military effectiveness. I chose to step aside from the battlefield and the US military calls this phase zero, right? Which is the pre-conflict phase where the armed forces are developing their plans. They're constantly improving their posture and readiness. I look at how Arab militaries are postured before they fire a single shot. I analyze their defense institutional capacity, which means I analyze how they create and enforce defense rules and effectively perform the functions of planning, budgeting, managing, employing, training, equipping, and sustaining. So for me, it's really less about hardware and equipment and more about the software of defense, the foundation of defense, the institutions of defense. I mean, look at what's happening in Ukraine right now, if you guys are monitoring this. Do you think the Russians are lacking weapons or firepower? No, they're not. Then how come they are struggling so bad? Now, of course, there are many reasons for this. But one of the reasons I'd like to believe is that the Russian military entered the war with very bad planning and very bad logistics, two key elements of defense institutional capacity. In the book, I chose to tackle the issue of deficient defense institution building on the part of the Arab partners by incorporating the relationship with the United States. There is just too much history between the United States and those Arab partners in political and military affairs, almost 80 years. And there's a ton of security cooperation between the two sides. I didn't think it was right to analyze Arab defense institutional capacity without looking at US military assistance to the Arab world, at least since the mid to late 1970s. My main point is that this failure to develop effective and sustainable military capability is not the Arabs alone. It is a collective failure. And there is plenty of blame to go around, a good bit of it belonging to the United States. When we provide over many decades, trillions of dollars in US military assistance to the region, and when we have thousands of troops and equipment stationed in the region, the story of Arab military development cannot be told without take, uh, talking about the Americans as well. And that's exactly what I do in the book. My analysis focuses on US military assistance to the Arab world and how it has evolved over the years and how it has contributed to weak military power in the hands of our Arab partners. Let me talk about this evolution and start by asking the following question. Why has the record of US security cooperation in the Middle East been so bad? I think it starts with a pretty basic point which has to do with willingness on both parts, on the part of the United States, on the part of the Arab partners. So pre 
or pre-2003 Iraq war, if you want. This really wasn't an urgent priority for either side. You know, we were willing and capable of defending our Arab partners. They didn't bother in investing in self-defense capabilities. They trusted us to do that for them. And pre 9-11, we really preferred a hands-on approach to the Middle East because the stakes were so high. We didn't really trust the capabilities, not only of the Arabs, but also our European allies. We wanted to do it ourselves because that region mattered tremendously to the US national interest. Now, what we wanted from the Arabs during that period was less their military capabilities and more access, basing, and overflight rights. And of course, the money from the wealthy uh, Gulf partners rather than their military capabilities. And during that period, so pre 9-11, our adversaries, whether they're state actors or non-state actors, they were relatively weak. So those threats that we were facing were pretty much manageable. Um, and then the final reason why this record has been so bad is because we were, and still are in many ways, committed to what we call the qualitative military edge of Israel. So that's QME, right? Which meant that there was a ceiling to what we would provide our Arab partners in terms of equipment, in terms of weapons, uh, because of that commitment to the qualitative military edge of Israel, which later on became a law um, and became, it became a whole lot more serious. All of those factors that I just mentioned now transport them to post 9-11 and everything has changed. This, which is why US security cooperation in the Middle East became a whole lot more uh, critical, a whole lot more urgent. We are less willing nowadays to invest militarily or use force in the region. And the Arabs don't trust us as much to actually defend them like we did in the past. And if you recall, one of the you know, biggest examples, obviously, where we stepped in and decisively to defend them was in Operation Desert Storm, right? When uh, we evicted the uh, Iraqi military from Kuwait and liberated Kuwait and, of course, defended the Saudis. Um, Today, we are less interested in that approach of basically doing everything on our own or becoming the guardian or the policeman of the region. We prefer a collective approach with our partners in the Middle East, but also with our allies in Europe. Now, we still need access basing and overflights and some of that money from the wealthier Gulf partners, but we also now need their military capabilities and we need their security contributions. So we need a whole lot more than what we did in the past. Add to that, our adversaries are not as weak anymore. They're much stronger. They have capabilities that are quite effective, whether it's precise missiles, whether it's um, the smuggling is far more uh, comprehensive, whether it's at sea or on land, and you name it. Uh, and you're seeing all those attacks that have taken place over the past few months and years against uh, some of our Gulf partners uh, coming from Yemen or coming straight from Iran. Last but not least, the issue of the qualitative military edge of Israel is really far less relevant in today's world, in today's strategic environment in the Middle East than it was before. Because simply Arab-Israeli relations have dramatically improved. Right? In the past, the Israelis were always worried about what kind of weapons we provide to the Arabs because of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Right? Not only is the Arab-Israeli conflict over in the sense that I don't expect us to see another large-scale Arab-Israeli war like we did in the past, right? but the relations between the Arabs and the Israelis, in addition to Egypt and Jordan who signed peace treaties with the Israelis, now you've got a bunch of other Arab countries that have much improved relations with the Israelis. Lately, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans who normalized ties with the Israelis in the Abraham Accords. So because those relations have dramatically improved, there are far fewer concerns in Israel about us providing more potent weapons to our Arab partners. When, when I say that we need a lot more help from our Arab partners when it comes to security cooperation, uh, what exactly do I mean by that? Where, what are those areas where they need to step in and step up? The number one area, obviously, which is where we struggle the most, is in combating violent extremism 
or if you want to call it combating terrorism. Okay, this is where their law enforcement, their intelligence sharing, their counterterrorism financing, uh, their terrorism prevention, their de-radicalization, they could do it a whole lot better than we ever can. They know their territories, they know their societies, they know their local environments way better than we do, obviously. And so we need a lot more help in that number one area, which is the one challenge that we struggle with the most in the Middle East. Border security. We need their help in reconnaissance, surveillance, rapid reaction, and counterinsurgency. We cannot defend their borders anymore. We did that in the past. We deployed hundreds of thousands of troops, right? to defend the Kuwaitis and the Saudis. We can't do that anymore. They have to step up and defend their own borders in those areas that I just mentioned. Missile defense, especially lately, you, as I mentioned before, those attacks that you're seeing from the Houthis in Yemen or the Iranians themselves, or even militias belonging to uh, the Iraqis that are loyal to the Iranians, you need the Arab partners to step up in the area of missile defense. And the best way for them to step up is by integrating their capabilities, or what we call integrated air missile defense in the region. Two more areas where they need to step up is naval power to help us with maritime security, right? And cybersecurity. There is no way we can send a cyber army to the Middle East to help them deter or counter cyber attacks. They need to do it themselves. And we could certainly help, we could provide all sorts of assistance, but we cannot deploy troops, essentially, quote unquote, cyber troops to help them in that area. So those are the main areas where I see where the Arab partners need to step up big. Um, let me talk about how do we typically cooperate with our Arab partners in the areas of military affairs, right, in security cooperation. So I mentioned the arms transfers, right? We give them arms, we give them a whole lot of weapons, a boatload of guns and trucks and fighter jets and so on and so forth. That's one way where we cooperate with our air partners. And it is essentially the spinal cord of security cooperation, not just in the Middle East, frankly, but around the world. We conduct military advising. So we do it on the ground and we do it also in Washington where we form with them uh, vehicles of you know, advice where we, uh, talk to them about uh, how they should be building their capabilities, what kind of equipment they should be buying, and so on and so forth. We do joint exercises with them in the region. So every single Arab partner that we have in the region, we have joint exercises with them, and they're not few. There are many of them, and they happen across domains, whether it's uh, at sea, on land, in the air. The, uh, they're frequent, they're quite frequent, and they continued even during the global uh, pandemic. And then last area where we cooperate, cooperate with them is in professional military education in the sense that the Arabs send their finest officers uh, to the United States to um, attend classes, to learn about a few topics in military affairs and international security more broadly. And then the hope is that we develop personal connections with these officers and later on when they get promoted, when they assume positions of leadership, uh, we feel a whole lot better because we've known this person, they have been educated in the United States, and now we can form closer bonds with them. The last area, which obviously is the focus of my book when it comes to security cooperation, is this institutional capacity building, right? Or you can also call it defense institution building, where we help them out across the what the United States military calls .MLPFP. And every single letter of this acronym means something, whether it's management, logistics, planning, personnel, leadership, and so on and so forth. And my main premise, obviously, in the book is that we don't do sufficiently this very important pillar of security cooperation. We do it very little of that, which is the main problem, why they have such weak military capabilities. Now, there have been some positive changes in U.S. security cooperation in the Middle East and around the world, not just in the region, uh, which I would like to highlight very briefly here, which, of course, I do in the book. There's been new legislation by the United States Congress uh, that has led to new authorities and some bureaucratic changes in the Pentagon that in many ways compel us to focus a whole lot more on institutional capacity building. And again, not just in the Middle East, but in other uh, regions of the world. And those uh, changes, legislative changes, came up in the 2017 NDAA, National Defense uh, Authorization Act. And there was a whole section on security cooperation reforms. 
So essentially now we are legally obligated to not just provide trucks and guns to these uh, Arab partners, but to also help them in this process of defense reform or defense institutional capacity building. And there is evidence that has actually done a lot of these things, uh, even though, like I said, very insufficiently, right? And uh, I provide four case studies in the book, right? So Lebanon being one of them, Saudi Arabia is another, Jordan is another, but then I also discuss the UAE case, even though we don't directly help them with the process of defense reform, they're actually doing it on their own. But I think it's a very fascinating case study because uh, the UAE military to me is by far the most effective Arab military, right? And so I was trying to understand why they are more effective than others and whether they have invested in defense institutional capacity um, uh, better than others, right? And it turned out that they didn't, even though they still ended up with a more effective military. So that's why I sort of mentioned the UAE case to see uh, what are the main reasons why they are more effective than others and whether there is any, you know, greater investments in defense institutional capacity. Um, now, I want to talk very briefly about the lingering challenges as to why this thing is so damn hard, right? I mean, it's one thing to say we need to invest in defense institutional capacity in the Middle East to help them create more effective militaries, but it's another altogether to understand how extremely challenging this is and why this is so difficult, not just for us, but for them too. I mean, at the end of the day, it took us 80 years to develop an effective military in the United States, all the way from 1903 to 1986 with Goldwater Nichols, right? So if you can imagine a superpower like us taking 80 years to actually develop an effective military, a joint military, then how many more decades it would take the Arabs to do that who have never really been serious about developing serious military capabilities because they've always trusted us to defend them uh, from various threats. What are some of the main challenges? So security cooperation um, as an enterprise in the United States is, even though I just said that we are now gradually investing a little bit more in, in institutional capacity building, this entire ecosystem is still far too heavily reliant and biased in favor of foreign military sales. We still are obsessed with arms sales, with weapon sales, with trucks and guns more than anything else. At the top of this security cooperation enterprise, I believe that we have very lacking leadership, which is one of the main reasons why we don't invest sufficiently and we don't execute proficiently institutional capacity building. Again, not just in the Middle East, but in many other regions of the world. We need more effective leadership at the very top in the Pentagon to promote this discipline far more effectively. Given my experience in the Pentagon, having overseen security cooperation in the broader region, in the Middle East, um, or what we call the CENTCOM area of uh, responsibility, AOR. I know that the organizational framework of security cooperation in the Pentagon is very much deficient, right? Uh, it is very much disjointed and overly bureaucratic. There are just too many cooks in the kitchen, even within the Pentagon. I'm not even talking about the State Department. And there's very little coordination, very little cohesion amongst the various stakeholders, whether it's the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, the civilian bureaucracy in the Pentagon, and the combatant commands out in the field. And in our case, of course, here, we're talking about CENTCOM, which is Central Command. There's too little funding for this kind of stuff, too little funding for institutional capacity building. And when you have very little funding for it, there's obviously a limit to how much you can really pursue it, right? Always gets back to budget. And then last but not least, there is no official strategy for security cooperation, period. Not just in the Middle East, but across the world. You know, we keep hearing from the Pentagon that it, this is such a critical pillar, that this is such a critical element of the national defense strategy. We needed to cultivate more partners across the world to develop the existing partnerships that we have across the world. And yet, we don't have an official strategy for it. How is that possible? Now, there's a lot of language in many documents about security cooperation, but there isn't an official strategy for security cooperation. Like we do, for example, for cyber, like we do for irregular warfare. We have official strategies for these two domains. For security cooperation, we don't have it. And which is very disappointing and frankly inexplicable. If you think that this is so critical and so important to the US national interest and to the strategic objectives that we have across the world when it comes to our global alliances and global partnerships, how come we don't have an official strategy for security cooperation? This is on the US side. 
which every single one of them, obviously, I go into great detail in the book. On the Arab side, which are no fewer monumental challenges, right? There's very little political will when it comes to investing in defense institutional capacity building. And there's a reason for it. And there's a good bit of scholarship, some of it very good, about why there's very little political will to invest in institutional capacity building. Every time you open up your national security system, every time you make it more inclusive, every time you create more institutions and there's greater interagency coordination, that means you are diluting your own power, whether you're at the very top as an autocrat, as a monarch, as a dictator, whatever you want in the Middle East, and there are many of those, right? Every time you're opening up that national security ecosystem, that means you are bringing in more people with more influence, with more authorities, and inevitably with more guns since we're talking about military affairs. That is not something that Arab autocrats are very excited about. You know, relinquishing some of their power, at least some of it, some of their privileges, that all requires political will and there's very little of that. Now, it is getting a whole lot better because they finally understand the critical importance of institutional capacity building as to why it's so important to build military effectiveness, right? But there's still very little of that still. The culture. Boy, are there many books about the importance of culture when it comes to military affairs. And I don't really get into <clears throat> the whole enchilada, right, in the book, because it's very extensive and you can go very different directions. And obviously it's beyond the scope of the book. But I still have to mention the importance of culture when we're talking about how you can create defense institutions and how you engage in the very important process of defense reform and defense governance. Culture has a very important say in this. Culture in many ways is a manifestation that manifests itself in multiple places, not just in society, not just in government, but also in your military. Because at the end of the day, your military obviously is a reflection of society and your political system. There are certain political attributes in the Arab world, be they related to authoritarianism, be they related to many other facets, that in many ways make it more challenging for the Arabs to invest in defense institutional capacity building. And so I get into that to some extent in the book. Bureaucracy. At the end of the day, if you're going to create institutions of defense, that means you are creating new bureaucracies, right? And the bureaucracy in the Arab world, which I get into in the book, is a very sad and disappointing story, right? One of the main reasons why Arabs have struggled when it comes to political reform, societal reform, cultural reform even, is because their bureaucracies have not aged very well. As a matter of fact, they're very old. And there's a, a good bit of scholarship by Sam Huntington, by many others, Nazih Ayubi, and many others who talk about bureaucracy in underdeveloped regions. And for Nazih Ayubi, obviously, in the Arab world. And I get into that a little bit. But the point being is that when you're building defense institutions, you're essentially building a whole new bureaucracy, right? And a whole new way of coordinating, institutionally speaking, empowering people. So it's not just buildings, it's also people you're investing in, giving them authorities, giving them uh, influence, and giving them real jobs, right? And real responsibilities. The track record of bureaucracy in the Arab world is a very poor one. And so if you can't build those in the public sector overall, because of a bunch of reasons, right, again, some of it related to culture, you're going to face the same struggles, the same challenges in the defense realm. The last but not least, which is an obvious term, and I'm going to end there, is that this process of defense reform, as I mentioned before, is a very long journey, okay? This is going to take more than a week, obviously. But my point is, in the book, is that this marathon, at least it has started in the Arab world, at least in some of the cases that I just mentioned, whether it's in Saudi Arabia and Lebanon and Jordan and in a couple of other places. So the good news that it has started, like it has never started before, right? And so it could take a long time, but at least now we have a little bit more political will on the part of these Arab partners so that we can come in and help them in ways like we've never helped them before. So yes, the journey is very long, but at least it has started and it could take as long as it takes, but as long as you commit to these processes of execution, of implementation, to make this more credible, to make this more applicable and move from 
you know, strategy, grandiose strategies of how you're going to build an entirely new military like the Saudis have always talked about, and then come back to real life and really implement plans that will get you from point A to point B far more effectively and do this gradually. You know, don't, don't do this like all at once. Do this gradually so that it actually becomes manageable, actually becomes implementable, and it actually offers room for advice coming from the United States and ideally from other places that are friendly to these countries. Jordan, uh, let me stop here. I think I've said enough and I am more than happy to take any questions you guys have. Back to you, Jordan. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, Folks, this is our time where we can open it up to questions. So if you have any, please feel free to just go ahead and use the raise hand function, uh, or you can put them in the chat and I will ask them out loud. Uh, while people, oh, wonderful. Quicken, you are on it, Simon. Uh, you can go right ahead. I am shocked that Simon is the first to speak. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the presentation. Uh, as always, it was awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit about this in class, but when, when some of the issues, um, with developing, um, these defense institutions in, in, on the Arab side, uh, are so deeply rooted in society and education and culture, uh, what are some of the steps that the United States can take, um, to move that along quicker when when it's really uh, you know so deeply ingrained, um, yeah, just kind of open ended. Sure, Jordan, do you want me to take that, or do you want to grab another question? Uh, let's go ahead, uh, Ido or Ido. I'm not sure. Apologies. Okay. Uh, go ahead and ask yours as well. Yeah. Hi. Go, go ahead. Hi, uh... Hi, Bilal. Um, hey, thanks for the talk. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm actually an associate fellow at the Washington Institute. I just wrote a book about ISIS called Soldiers of End Times, uh, where I deal with some of these topics. Um, and so the question I had is, uh, we've, we've seen that the U.S. has been pretty good uh, in some cases at uh, creating uh, effective special forces units, right. for example, right. the, the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service. Exactly. Um, or the Afghan Command is also a good example. Right. Uh, I wonder if you if you see that as a sustainable model. Sure. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? That's a perfect question. In many ways, uh, it is consistent with what Simon was talking about. So, yes, given these monumental political, cultural, societal challenges, what is it really that is realistic on our part? Right. What is it that we can really do to help these countries develop the very necessary defense institutional capacity? And in many ways, it gets to your question, uh, uh, you know, it's it's really starting small and special forces centric. You know, we're going to give up on this idea that we used to have in the past of helping them create heavy, large militaries that would do conventional stuff. Right. And so we finally recognized, and thanks to CENTCOM, that we have to be a little bit more realistic about these objectives and really focus on creating smaller, faster more sustainable militaries that tend to fulfill the key priorities, as I mentioned before, of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, right? Because this is really where we struggle the most. Now, of course, we are struggling nowadays with a lot of missile attacks and drone attacks. So we'll get to that later. But as an overarching concept of how we're going to actually help them, despite these monumental challenges, I think starting small and gradually and doing exactly what we've done with the Iraqis, some of what we did with the uh, Afghans, some of what we did with the Lebanese, as a matter of fact, is building these special forces centric militaries that are at least able and have a chance to sustain some of that very sophisticated and expensive hardware that we give them. So that's a great point, Ida. And thank you, Simon. All right, Kevin, I see you have your hand up. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, hey, Professor, really appreciate you giving this talk. Uh, my name is Kevin, I'm a student here at the SSP. Um, but I just, uh, I wanted to ask specifically about the Title X authorities sure. for security cooperation and how that's affected um, US foreign policy as a whole, um, specifically like 333 and previously 1206. What effect do you think sort of the empowerment of Title X specific security cooperation authorities has had on the DOD's role in security cooperation overseas, specifically in relation to how the State Department might want or 
might want to see security operations shouldn't be handled overseas. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jordan, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take that because it's a uh, it's quite a good question. And it's really comprehensive. So I'm going to spend a few more minutes on this. Um, and uh, Kevin, the, the the reason why I didn't want to talk about you know numbers when it comes to authorities is just I didn't want to. <clears throat> you know, I recognize that the audience is not all, you know, fluent in these sections and authorities and um, wanted to keep it more big picture. But obviously you are yourself well versed in this. So I'm going to talk about it. At the end of the day, this uh, evolution, or I would say um, uh, expansion of authorities in the hands of the Pentagon has started really after 9-11, right? Because uh, in many ways, the United States government recognized that the State Department and other agencies have struggled with the terrorism phenomenon and struggled with countering terrorism. And so we gave more authorities to the generals and the admirals to step into this field and to really help out uh, build uh, more effective partner militaries and security services around the world. Now, I'm not saying that the Pentagon did a much better job. As a matter of fact, that's the you know, main point in my book is that you know, it was more like the dog that caught the car. Once we caught the car, he didn't know what to do with it. Um, but this, this uh, mushrooming of authorities and especially budgets and influence when it comes to security cooperation has you know, fixed some problems, tactical, operational. You know, we've killed a lot of bad guys. We've uh, achieved a lot of tactical, operational objectives. We've uh, defeated the, uh, uh, I don't want to say defeated, matter of fact, we have uh, degraded the capabilities of the Islamic State. We defeated its state, if you want to say, the physical caliphate. Uh, but none of those strategic objectives uh, have been met, right? And so the ideal scenario, ideal outcome that you want to go for is greater coordination between the State Department and its Title 22 authorities, right? All well, the FMF and the FMS and IMET, and combining those with what the Department of Defense has when it comes to Title 10, and specifically Section 333 and Section 331, which get us into this issue of defense institutional capacity building. Now, that begs the question, is the Pentagon really best suited to pursue defense institution building? I don't know. It's an open-ended question, frankly, because at the end of the day, this is really the universe of development. And the Pentagon is really hostile to the world of development because it tends to be more of a long-term nature. This is really best suited for organizations like the State Department or the United States um, uh, USAID, right? Uh, and so this tension and these, these turf battles, these problems over jurisdiction, this lack of joint planning, you're going to see it for a long period of time, and I don't think it's ever going to change. But there are ways to sort of remedy this relationship. There are ways to do more effective joint planning between the two, uh, to combine the capabilities of each department. And it used to work a whole lot better during the Cold War, Kevin, right? Because maybe because, I would say, we faced a similar threat that was quite you know, existential to us. That was the Soviets, right? So it sort of obligated, it sort of forced us to be more cohesive, to coordinate across departments far more effectively. After that, after the end of the Cold War, we became, you know, a whole, the threats became far more diffuse. The necessity to coordinate became a little bit less urgent. And so this is where we ended up with very disparate, very separate you know, two departments uh, trying to pursue this mission of security cooperation or what the State Department calls security systems, right? That's the whole new different universe. Uh, and the product has been less than satisfactory, less than efficient, less than effective. And I don't need to tell you those examples. You know, we spent 20 years trying to train the uh, and build effective forces in Afghanistan and ended up collapsing in a matter of 11 days. Now, there are many reasons for that. Obviously, it's not just an issue of failure of security cooperation. There's a whole lot of politics in Washington involved. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that story. But it's the same thing with Iraq, right, where ISIS, when they uh, pursued their blitz and the Iraqi military, you know, fled the battlefield and didn't want to fight. A lot of that really is, is the result of this very poor planning of security cooperation and really not training them on the key things that really matter the most, which is really creating a foundation for defense that really allows you to not only effectively operate the equipment, but also sustain it. So this is what the book is all about at the end of the day. If you really want to summarize it in three numbers, that's really section triple three. And how do you actually better utilize it? How do you take advantage of it in ways like we didn't before? And of course, as you said yourself, these used to be 1206. But the reason why triple three is far more interesting than 1206 is because now it really is a legal obligation 
for us to pursue institutional capacity building like we never did before. Thank you very much, God rest his soul, John McCain, because he is really the author of the security cooperation reforms. Now it's a matter of implementation. Now it's a matter of execution. And we need the State Department to step in and also to jointly plan with the Department of Defense. And in many ways, this is gonna require some chemistry between the two secretaries, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense. Because in the law, in, on paper, there's all sorts of language really suggesting that the two secretaries should be working together. Oh, in accordance with this and that, or with the concurrence of the Secretary of State, we need to do X, Y, and Z. But in real life, none of that joint planning, none of that coordination really is taking place, which is a tragedy that has in many ways led to these failures across the region, not just in the Middle East, but also in Africa and other places around the world. Thanks so much for taking the time to answer that pretty Thank huge question. It, it is a huge one, but I, I love the question. Thank you, Kevin. All right, Jordan, I think we have a question from Elizabeth. Yeah, we just had a question come in in the chat. You want me to read that out? Please. And Elizabeth, I want to say, is one of my better students in class. So Elizabeth asks, in terms of missile defense, aside from cooperation needed on the Arab side to create an effective integrated missile defense system, is there anything else the U.S. could do to incentivize our Arab partners to work together? Also, are Arab partners already equipped with the best missile system, missile defense systems needed to defer, deter Iranian aggression while the U.S. shifts focus to the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, why don't we just start with the technical stuff, which is the second part of the question, because that's the easier part. Are they uh, <clears throat> equipped with the best missile defense systems? In large part, yes, but they are lacking what we also are lacking ourselves and everybody else across the world which is the shorter range uh, missile defense systems or even air defense systems that um, would be effective against, you know, those cruise missile attacks and armed drone attacks. Because at the end of the day, we are struggling with those because those uh, assets that we have are not able to track, are not able to see those slow flying, low altitude missiles that are coming uh, our way and the way of those Arab partners. So we are still in the process of developing and I'm pretty sure Lockheed Martin and many other companies are working on this 24-7 uh, uh, on coming up with, and including the Israelis. As a matter of fact, there was just a piece in the news not too long ago saying that the Israelis have actually developed new capability, uh, laser-based technology to an energy-based technology to uh, actually track and defeat those incoming missiles, whether they're cruise or uh, armed drones. So, but largely speaking, when it comes to the longer range, when it comes to the ballistic missiles, they certainly have some of the best capabilities out there, right? Whether it's the Patriots, whether it's the Thads, you name it. Um, their challenge, just like ours, is on the issue of shorter range, uh, slow flying, lower altitude cruise and armed drones. What can we do to further incentivize them to work together? I have no idea, Elizabeth. I think we've done everything we can to come up with laws, to come up with policies, to come up with all sorts of initiatives, all the way from 2008 with Robert Gates to Chuck Hagel, to many others after them, showing them the fruits of greater cooperation on this. Because at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding, right? And so we show them how this works in other regions to incentivize them to work uh, together, but the politics are just such a huge challenge in that part of the world. They don't trust each other as much, as you very well know. And so I think one of the ways that we can break this so that we don't really keep this hostage to the um, mistrust in the region and to the politics of the region, one of the ways to sort of break this is to really start, and in many ways actually gets to the first question asked, to start small and gradually, in the sense that you pick two or three countries that we know like each other a little bit more and trust each other a little bit more and face the same challenges, face the same threats, start with that consortium and then push them to really integrate their missile defenses, their radars, their capabilities. And then later on, when the politics become a little bit better, then when there's a little bit more trust among these countries, bringing the others who they've had problems with in the past, whether it's the Qataris, whether it's the Omanis, you name it. But first start with those who seem to have more political cohesion, more cooperation amongst themselves, greater trust amongst themselves. I would say that's the Saudis, that's the Emiratis, and that's the Bahrainis. Start with this trio. It's very doable. And then later on, bring in others, because the more you have in that consortium, the more you have in that group, that means the better coverage you have. That means the greater domain awareness uh, when it comes to missiles incoming, whether it's from Yemen or from Iraq. But there's always going to be a limitation, okay? I mean, if we can't want it more than they do, right? Elizabeth. And so 
we'll continue to push. We'll continue to do apply economic, you know, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say economic pressure. I would say political pressure more than anything else. Diplomatic pressure. Show them the fruits of greater integration, and then it's at the end of the day, it really is up to them to do this. Thank you, Professor. You got it. Great. Anybody else have a question? Feel free to pop it in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to ask, you know, you obviously the book focuses very much on the Middle East. Um, right. That is your er primary area of expertise and your uh, focus here. But what lessons do you see from what you have researched in the book for other parts of the world? Um, what lessons can the U.S. take away, whether that's the Indo-Pacific to uh, you know, situations currently happening in Europe, uh, all of our other fronts that we are working in as well. That's a fascinating question, Jordan. Thank you very much. And actually to show why this really works, I needed to look at cases from outside the region, right? Um, and where we've actually invested a good bit in what I call defense reform or defense governance or defense management or defense institutional capacity building, right? I needed to take a look at cases outside the region to show how this really works and why we've been actually quite successful at those cases. And I hope I'm not forgetting any of them here because they're in the book. So one of the cases is Georgia, right? Look, I'm not an expert on Europe. I'm not an expert on Latin America. I'm not an expert on Africa, but I needed to know a bit more about what is happening outside the Middle East and this domain to really show why this is so important and why it's been successful for us and why it has really actually generated some pretty significant security cooperation returns for us. So I took a look at Georgia, right? I took a look at Colombia and I took a look at the Philippines. All three cases are extremely successful cases of security cooperation with us in large part because over a number of years, not just over a few weeks or months, a number of years, we have committed to helping them pursue this very critical process of defense reform, essentially overhauling their entire national security process and national security system, right? So it's not just an infusion of cash, not just an infusion of weapons and trucks and guns, but actually really helping them with all levels of defense reform, whether it's the planning, whether it's coming up with human resources management uh, documents, whether it's actually helping them with strategy, how do you come up with the national defense strategy? How do you come up with the national security strategy? How do you train your own troops? How do you hire? How do you fire? How do you recruit? How do you promote? All of those basic things that you essentially that you see in any business or any organization, nonprofit or for profit, not just militaries, but all those things that really get to core issues of management. How do you sustain your growth? How do you um, bring in the right people, right, for the right jobs at the right time? All of these things apply to the defense realm. Because a lot of this really, this is why it's so fascinating, the issue of reform, be it institutional, be it economic, political, and so on and so forth, it really, at the end of the day, is about creating new institutions. It's about bringing in the right kind of people. And that applies also to the defense world. And those three cases that I have in the book very nicely document the fruits of credible effective security cooperation that's done actually the right way. Now we're starting to do some of that in the Middle East, but it's such an embryonic stage. It is very insufficient. It is not the same kind of commitment and we need to do a whole lot more of it, which is exactly the point of the book. So it's Georgia, Colombia, the Philippines, and I have some very practical, tactical lessons that can be learned from those cases, which I don't wanna bore the audience with right now. Well, thank you for the, thank you for the brief unboring, uh answer to that. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Gia, you can go ahead. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm also a student at, at SSP, and I have a question that kind of related to the great power competition in the sure. Middle East. Uh, like uh, their news about China helping Saudis to build the ballistic system and also like drone cooperation between China and Saudis and also UAE. So I wonder uh, if your book kind of address how US should respond uh, to this challenge of the security alternatives. Thank you. Sure, of course. And that is now becoming it's such a hot topic, right? Uh, because of the tensions, uh, I would say historic tensions between the United States and some of these key Arab partners. I mean, we want certain things from them now, whether it's energy cooperation, whether it's cooperation in geopolitics, especially as it relates to Ukraine. Now we want them to increase their oil output, but they are not. Um, and so 
how can we further commit to their security without really committing to things that are completely unrealistic? I mean, that is such an open-ended question, but it is the right kind of question to ask, right? Um, you know, when, um, when we see the Chinese and to some extent the Russians really um, making inroads into the region, obviously that's gonna come at the expense of the United States. There's no question about it. These are adversaries of ours. And so if they expand their influence across the region, that's gonna come at our expense. But in many ways that's inevitable, right? Because A, they do have the capabilities to do that. And B, they provide certain incentives to cooperate uh, for these Arab partners that, you know, in many ways they're just really hard to refuse and hard to reject. You've mentioned a couple of those areas, uh, whether it's uh, selling them drones, whether it's cooperating on missile defense. I would say to this very day still, it is very limited. Now, does that mean it's going to stay limited? No, it could very much evolve and it's going to, it could very much, you know, expand, uh, especially if those tensions that we have with the Gulf Arab partners are going to continue and if not deteriorate, right? But when we talk about MySpace, which is defense institution building, when it comes to defense reform, Nobody does it better than the United States. And I think the Arab partners understand that very well. There might be areas of cooperation when it comes to technical, when it comes to weapons, when it comes to short-term gains, right? And it's inevitable that the Chinese are going to offer something that is exciting to these Arab partners. Same for the Russians. But when it comes to this building foundations that are solid to creating effective militaries, nobody does it better than the United States. And nobody actually can offer that kind of advice to the Arabs that is uh, meaningful to them, that is credible, better than the United States. There's, a, as I mentioned before, there's a history spanning more than eight decades of relations, of cooperations between us and the Arabs. Ever since Roosevelt met with the king, Saudi king, on that ship and then had a deal, which what we call the oil for security covenant, right, to this very day. There's all sorts of shared sacrifices on the battlefield and politically speaking. We've had so many joint missions with them, whether it's defeating the Soviets, whether it's defeating violent extremism in certain areas in certain parts of the world. And so it's really hard to replicate that kind of relationship with the Chinese and the Russians. And if I were an Arab partner, I really would not be trusting that much what the Russians and the Chinese offer in that regard, because it's just not as good as what we have. And so I'm less worried about those Chinese and Russian inroads, even though obviously there are parts in the Pentagon, there are parts in the US defense industry that are very much worried about that because there's a ton of competition when it comes to you know, arms sales, but I don't care about that. I'm not worried about those things. We still have a very privileged positions in what we call the global arms trade. We're still number one in the entire world and it's not even close who comes second. So I'm more worried about us reducing our commitment to the region and us sending all sorts of wrong messages to these partners that we don't care about them as much. And so if that's gonna continue, then they're gonna to go to the Chinese and the Russians and ask them for advice on issues as defense institution building, even though that kind of advice is gonna be pretty poor and pretty bad. I mean, again, I need to give you the examples of what's going on in Ukraine. And the Russians, they've struggled so badly, militarily speaking, because they do not take seriously the issues that we take seriously when it comes to defense institution building their logistics, their sustainment, their planning, all of that. Imagine that kind of advice now given to the Arabs. They're gonna help them create far more ineffective militaries than they've ever had. And so we should be the go-to partner for these Arabs, except that we need to commit a little bit more diplomatically, politi politically, militarily speaking to maintain that kind of relationship, which in my world should really be, there should be no alternative to it, frankly. There are no better alternative to it. So. I'm all in favor of for competition and it's inevitable, right? And as you called it yourself, the great power competition or strategic competition, it's an inevitable part of international relations, right? But I'm less worried about them really getting into the areas of defense reform, getting into the areas of defense institution building, because frankly, A, I don't think they're interested in doing that. They just want it really a transactional relationship with the Arabs more than anything else, right? They want access, they want to sell them weapons, which frankly, that was our motto. Back in the day, that was our motto, which obviously has come back to bite us in the behind, right? But now we understand that what we were doing in the past sort of expired. And now we, to do, we need to do things differently and more efficiently than ever before and more effectively. But if the Chinese and the Russians are gonna come into the region and get involved a little bit more, it's still gonna be transactional. And it's not gonna help the Arabs in any way develop the right kind of militaries 
that gets them to sustainment, that gets them to effective employment of their equipment and in their armed services. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. We still have a few minutes before uh, our hour finishes up. Do we have any final questions uh, for Professor Saw? I see Bassem who plays with me weekly basketball. I know he's not gonna ask me a question. He'll, he'll save them for the court. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, that's very true. Yep, all right, Bassem, I'll see you later. Yes, see you soon. Well, then do you have any final words for the audience um, other than, you know, of course, buy the book when it comes out? Well, I'm, I'm less worried about that, frankly. I know that my, pub <laughs> my publisher is going to kill me when I say those things. I'm going to be the worst promoter of my book. But look, uh, this issue really matters uh, because of this new strategic environment, this new strategic transition that we're in. We're now shifting our attention, shifting our resources, shifting our everything from the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific. And there is only one way for us to do that effectively without shooting ourselves in the foot. And that is investing in the things that really matter when it comes to military affairs with those Arab partners. And it's less the trucks and guns, it's less the equipment, it's less the weapons. And we're gonna to continue to do that, don't get me wrong. I'm not an anti arms sales guy. I'm a pro making those arms sales actually effective and useful than contributing to your own US national interests and to your objectives in the region. So for me, it's less about financial profit, which is good, I'm not against that. But I want them to contribute more effectively, more comprehensively to our entire set of objectives in the region that will help us effectively make this transition to the Indo-Pacific, okay? That is the final words that I wanna you know, say to this audience. And, um, and obviously there are many other cases where we've started to do some of these things, but I would say they're far less prominent, they're far less extensive, they're far less serious than in the three case studies that I mentioned in the book, which are Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. I hope to see more cases down the road but I also have to recognize that we do have you know, fewer resources now to do these things. Although I do mention that it's really less about money when it comes to institutional capacity building. Those, th those things don't cost a whole lot, by the way. You know, I'd like to see more funds into them, fair enough, but they don't cost a whole lot. It's an issue of political commitment more than anything else. And it's an issue of prioritization. Once we recognize how critical those efforts are, those activities are, then I'm pretty sure we can find the funds in the Pentagon with our $700 billion budget to commit a little bit more resources into this because they're so instrumental to our long-term objectives and to our long-term interests in the Middle East. No more whack-a-mole. Let's really help these guys actually step up and really police themselves as opposed to what we used to do in the poor where we were actually the sole guardian who did everything on our own. We can't do that anymore. We can't afford to do that anymore. Great. Well, that would be a great place to wrap up, but I do want to give Fariel a question to or an opportunity to ask her question. So we'll go with that and then we'll wrap up. Sure. Uh, I can ask later or I can- No, nope, go ahead, ask. Go. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if uh, there was one key elements of cultural difference between those three countries and the countries in Middle East that you think was making the difference for the strategies working in those countries only. Okay, fair enough. Feria, you'd be shocked to know that the cultural similarities are significant, which is why, you know, and I, once again, I refer you to Ken Pollock's fantastic book on this. There's a whole section on the importance of culture, right? And there's a good bit of other scholarship, right, on the importance of culture when it comes to military affairs in the region and in other regions of the world. But the similarities are just stark, starkingly, you know, uh, numerous, right? And um, whether it's the Jordanians, the Saudis, the the Lebanese to a certain extent, uh, those attributes, those, how they manifest themselves in, uh, you know, in, on the battlefield, but also outside the battlefield in terms of how they actually build their bureaucracies, in terms of how they actually coordinate amongst themselves, this issue of memorization as opposed to actually using critical thinking, this issue of very little appetite for delegating authority, this issue of hesitance to bring the bad news to the boss, right? I mean, we've seen these across the region and in multiple wars, right? This issue of how do you actually handle information? How do you actually jealously guard it yourself as opposed to sharing it with your colleagues? Uh, the issue of empowerment, right? The very hierarchical structures that they uh, build, all of those things, frankly, are predominant across the Arab world. And they're just so similar, really, 
varies very little when we're talking about different countries uh, in the region. Uh, I, I would have loved to, maybe that's for another book, I would have loved to compare that with Iranian culture, right? And so whether those cultural similarities are the same. I would suspect that I would find some things that are similar, but probably other things that are not so similar. And so, you know, when I talk about culture, I'm really specifically talking about the Arab world and not the entire region, obviously. And there's you know, again, there's Turkey, also there's Israel. And if you go all the way up to Central Asia, there's a bunch of countries that are have different political cultures, obviously. But in the Arab world, the similarities when it comes to culture, be it in the public service, be it in the militaries, be it in the bureaucracy, are just so similar, you'd be shocked. And I really encourage you to read, once again, Ken Pollock's book on this. And there's a, you know, there's a small section in my book about it. Okay, thank you. So I'm from Iran. I can say I, that I some figured... of the ones... <laughs> that you mentioned are very similar to Iranian way of thinking, but I also lived in Georgia and Philippines. And I have a, some insight why it worked in Georgia and Philippines and not in the Middle East, but that's not appropriate for this discussion. Well, well for yeah, the, the issue is less about cultural convergence, right? It's mm -hmm. less an issue of the United States coming in and imposing its own culture, its own habits, its own norms. Yeah. This is not the point of the book. The book is actually offering tailored advice and tailored assistance mm -hmm. that actually works in the cultural environment of the Arabs, right? The issue yeah. is not about completely overhauling their culture. I mean, this is just completely nonsense, obviously. True. It's an issue of how do you find areas of convergence that actually make sense to the Arabs, right? For example, I'll give you an example. If I know that the Arabs are used to using a certain Soviet equipment and they've been using it for such a long time and they're actually good at it. They're very effective at it. I'm not going to come in and impose my own equipment, my U.S. equipment, just because it's mine. I'd like to come in and offer them advice and actually use it more effectively that is actually consistent with their own culture, that is um, not going to make them you know, overhaul everything that they're doing. Now, some countries like the UAE, believe it or not, are actually far more interested in Western concepts, are more interested in Western norms, and more interested in completely overhauling everything in their military affairs and adopting everything that is Western. They're actually less interested in their own norms and in their own uh, uh, way of doing things, militarily speaking. And that is one of the reasons, I'm not going to say the most important reason, but it's one of the reasons why they've been able to learn more quickly and adopt these concepts more effectively than others. But there's always going to be a limitation in terms of if you're going to completely absorb everything that is foreign, there's going to be a limitation because not everybody in your society is going to be happy with that. Not everybody, not everybody in your society is going to be used to that, and they're going to cling to their own way. So the best kind of advice, the best kind of assistance is providing it in a way that is tailored. And so I think you've seen that mm -hmm. tremendously in Georgia. You've seen that in Colombia. Yeah. You've seen that also in the Philippines. And so I'm glad you mentioned those cases and I'm glad you also have some expertise in this and I'd love to talk to you more about it off, offline. Obviously, I will reach out. Thank you very much. Okay, Faria. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to everybody who stayed on for a little over a full hour. Um, so that Bilal's publisher, uh, publisher does not kill him, the title of that book is Rebuilding Arab Defense, U.S. Security Cooperation in the Middle East, and it will be out very soon. Um, Bilal, I know you are pretty active um, online. Where can folks find you? Oh, I'm so not active at all. I'm actually not on social media at all. Um, I, am, I, I'm, I know, I'm a, kind of an ancient dinosaur. I'm on uh, LinkedIn, and that's pretty much it. Okay, why did I think you were on Twitter? Okay. Nope. All right, well, never mind. Um, don't find him. Don't find him online. Just just look at the book and uh, or LinkedIn. Just just find me on LinkedIn. That's all. Or you know, find him on LinkedIn. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you all for uh, coming in. I appreciate you all. Take care.